Hello, and welcome to another very exciting Bayonne today. We have a guest today who is very experienced in his field. He is here representing a family business that's been in Bayonne for close to 90 years. And he will explain to us the be his beginnings in the business and also where we are now in exterminating in Bayonne. I'd like to introduce you to Ralph Citarella Jr. Ralph, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Diane. Appreciate it. You're welcome. We had a little chat before we went on screen talking about your history here in town. Fill us in a little bit on what was going on 90 years ago in the Citarella family. Um, the business first first started off with uh, a gentleman named Harry Alberts, who was uh, a lifetime Bayonne native, 1926. Okay. was when he initially started Bayonne Exterminating. Mm -hmm. As he started getting busier and busier, he um, actually ended up hiring my grandfather. That's how it happened. Okay. So that was my grandfather's entry into the business before World War II. He worked with Harry, um, mm -hmm. and the business was growing and, and things were going well. Ultimately, my grandfather was drafted into um, the Navy as a shipwright. Okay. And spent his time, spent a couple years in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So after the war was over, he had to come back, and, and he basically got back into business with Harry, who was getting ready to retire. Oh, okay. So my grandfather at that point purchased the business from Harry, mm -hmm. and Bayonne Exterminating became solely um, our families. Mm -hmm. And we've been in continuous operation, family-owned since then. Wow. And what about your location? Now you're on Avenue C. Your address on Avenue C is? 1065. 1065 Avenue C. Have you always been at that same location or have you been kind of all over town? For a while, um, when the company was small, when it was still grandma and grandpa, they ran it off the porch of their house on 35th Street. Really? Where on 35th? Um, actually, the old Singer House on 35th Street between uh, Kennedy Boulevard and Avenue C. Oh my goodness, I lived on 35th, but between Broadway and Avenue E. Okay, so they ran it on their porch? Yeah, yeah, when we, when after Grandma died and we cleaned out the house, we got into a couple desks on the front porch and found some of the original stationery and pencils and stuff wow. with um, the same phone number. You know, we've had, it was Federal 95119. Wow. Um, and it has been for 90 years. You know, oh and it was goodness. a great trip back in time, finding some of the, you know, the, the old receipts, 50-year-old mm -hmm. receipts, things mm -hmm. like that. It was very, very, very cool to, to take that step back. So your family has actually seen the town grow, too, because my imagination would basically tell me that. Um, they're probably, I mean, we were developing 90 years ago. Yeah. So from what, you, what we have now... And what, how your business started? It was a, it was a business that just continued to grow, and obviously the need, the need was here. Absolutely. Uh, um, your, you got into the business though. It wasn't you didn't jump right into it though. You said at ten years old. Um, when I was a kid, my father would take me around to to help out or carry his toolbox. You know, um, I always had a great relationship with my father, and and you know he would always bring me along for stuff like that. Uh, when I was 13 or 14, I was able to start actually working and helping out, and I started helping out on termite jobs. Termite jobs. Okay. Um, yeah, and I really got involved in, in termite work, and as soon as I got a driver's license, I was doing route work and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of been involved with Bayonne Exterminating since I was able to work. Wow. But through, now you did tell, so tell me a little bit about your history, though. You went to uh, Trenton State. Right. Okay. And you worked through college as a bartender? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was actually a really good experience. I was in the Charlie Brown's Franchise Corporation, mm -hmm. um, which had, I think at the time, over 100 restaurants in a five or six state area. Mm -hmm. Charlie Brown's was really expanding well in the, in the mid and late 90s when I was there. They brought me into their management trainee program with mm -hmm. the eyes of making me a general manager. Mm -hmm. um, and that was how I worked through college. I was working as a bartender, waiter. I was doing a little work in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, the, the corporate climate at Charlie Brown started to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't really growing at the same pace, and it didn't. It wasn't the place it was when I first started working there. Okay. So I got involved in a small family restaurant um, where I started cooking a lot more. I had a chance to work with a, a great chef named Richie Ballas. I uh, was a graduate of CIA in New York, mm -hmm. and I worked as a cook under him for a couple of years. Okay, and then where where was there a trans transition from cooking 
we'll say to termites. Um, back to termites, yeah. Back to termites. Um, you know, the restaurant industry is always enjoyable, but there is a little bit of monotony in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it, it you know, just the, uh, the the familiarity, the similarity of it can, can be a bit of a drag. It's, so, it's also somewhat limited being a, a cook or a bartender. You know, it's not it's not necessarily a career unless you're going to be a chef, mm -hmm. you know? And that was kind of the crossroads I was at. I was at, um, I was I was 26 and I was really wondering what I was gonna be doing in 26 years from then. And um, I felt that, you know, it was time to be more involved. So I was actually negotiating purchasing a partnership or purchasing the entire restaurant from Richie. Mm -hmm. That was kind of where we were at or where my head was at. And um, I wanted to explore some options and I spoke to my father a little bit with that same mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, investing significantly in a restaurant industry with such a high rate of failure and being so location-based, it made a lot more sense to get involved in the service industry in a proven 80-year company with, a, you know, so much going for it, not, not even to mention the, the family aspect. Exactly. So it kind exactly. of brought me home and allowed me to reconnect with my family. Mm -hmm. Well, as a real estate agent, I know that the exterminator can be your best friend because many times, and, and it's not, it's, it's really, it would be the exception not to find some kind of, I don't know, infestation, which is normal in, in wood frame homes, which basically that's what my experience has been with in Bayonne. Um, maybe you can kind of set everybody's mind at ease that when you hear that there's ter there are termites or you hear that there's a problem, that it's an easy fix and it is rather common or or is that not correct um y you know what we're in an urban environment you know with with like you said wooden frame houses um pests like termites and ants are are natural in this environment so mm -hmm. they were kind of here before we were exactly um and really everyone is going to come in contact with some type of pest issue whether it's a mouse sneaking in or ants in the spring or termites found in a in a wood destroying insect inspection when a home is sold but these are things we've been doing for 90 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's there's very few circumstances that make it a an abnormal or a unique kind of control situation mm -hmm. for anything. Um, the products that we have now are so amazing compared to what was available to my father and grandfather. Um, the science has come far to allow us to use l extremely low amounts of, of actually toxic product. Oh, really? So you, so you know, basically gone green in a, in an as in some aspects. Yeah, we have whole lines of service that are pesticide free. Okay. Uh, that are that are based around steam cleaning or monitoring inspection. Um, there's a whole science uh, of in in uh, integrated pest management, which really? is something that we train all our technicians across the board in, mm -hmm. and it relies on um, behavioral controls of your client. You know, making sure they do the right things, taking out the garbage at the right time, small things like that. But once you codify them as a pest control program, all of a sudden those things get done every day. When okay. you know, so you know, so it's it, so so your service works hand in hand with the homeowner. Absolutely. Who has to come to realize that many in many instances some things may be preventable. Yeah. Once you take care of them. Yeah. One one of the things we see a lot with termite work, and it's kind of sad, is that a lot of people that with a crawl space and a dirt floored crawl mm -hmm. space, which you know is common mm -hmm. in this area, that's where the scrap lumber goes. Exactly. So we're going to lay old wood in moist dirt and wonder why there are termites there in three or four years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you know, one of the basic steps in that integrated pest management is to point out things like that, removing scrap lumber, um, you know, paying attention to moisture areas because, you know, you have that soil moisture and wood combination. That's exactly what a, what a termite colony is looking for to get started and have that kind of explosive growth. Mm -hmm. So if you avoid those things in the first place, you can head off a problem like that very early on before you, before you even have that termite pressure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's I, I've, exper I've seen it and I've experienced it. I mean, in my own home, you know, my home down the shore, we had a problem and it, it was solved because those homes were, were really very close to the soil. Um, but it's still, I think, people, people do get very, very nervous about it when they hear it. And that's why I wanted them to meet you because I mean, you you put you put my mind at ease whenever there's a problem, and I know that you've had not only a lot of experience, but you said today that you were a guest speaker, um, introducing 
you were in, in introducing someone at a, I guess it was a seminar? Um, yeah, that, but actually, um, that's where this uh, magazine cover comes from. I've been okay. involved with New Jersey Pest Management Association since I got back into the industry. Okay. My father was actually the president of New Jersey Pest Management for the last two years. Really? Um, I've, been, I've been part of part of the education committee and a couple other committees, but lately I've been a director of program and education. Okay. Um, the association represents almost 300 companies throughout the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was there for our uh, annual spring conference. Okay. And I had the pleasure of introducing a couple great speakers um, as we do our annual recertification course. You know. Now, with, th with education, obviously every I would imagine every so often there's an issue that is has has come to everyone's attention, and and one of them I know is bed bugs. Yeah. Okay. We never hadn't heard about them for a very long time, and then all of a sudden, all you started to hear about bed bed bug infestations in was hotels, and then people talked about movie theaters, and now I've seen them in some apartment buildings. Um, can you tell us and open up our eyes a little bit more about what they look like, what to expect, and you know what that that's all about? Absolutely. Um, the bed bug resurgence really happened right around 2000. Okay. Um, and it was actually a a kind of a mistake that my industry had allowed to perpetrate. Everyone fell in love with baiting technology because it was reduced pesticide application and impact. Baiting. So baiting technology means that? So everyone fell in love with termite baits, ant baits, roach baits, which are species specific pesticides designed to be consumed by that particular insect. Okay. So, so the idea of general preventive pest control using liquid applications or aerosol sprays or dusts like had been done for 40 years before okay. kind of fell away. Mm -hmm. um, the downside with species specific and non-general control is that your occasional invaders and your weird insects or your fringe insects can sneak back in. So a fringe insect would be considered a bed bug? They, in 1998, they certainly were. They and were then, but now they're what? Now they're mainstream? Yeah, now they're absolutely mainstream. Okay. Um, you know, uh, some studies estimate that urban populations will have 10 to 15 percent bed bug incidents. Um, I see that borne out in, in my work every day. So, I mean, you're, you're thinking of every one in 10 or one in eight people will is currently Experience dealing it. with a bed bug infestation. Wow. Any explanation for why that happened? Um, part of it was a lack of knowledge that happened initially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for I grew up with bed bugs being part of a nursery rhyme. Sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. True. So for the first five years that bed bugs made a large resurgence, people, you know, we were always answering a question that, no, it's not just a nursery rhyme. These are actual insects that, you know, plague the United States up until 1940. Mm-hmm. So then you add a little bit of, of urban density and a little bit of modern travel. Okay. And now you have this, you know, you, you have this great storm of, of these three events coming together to introduce a population of insects that people don't know much about and then give them the ability to travel locally, nationally, and internationally. Mm -hmm. And that's how we kind of got in the situation we were in. Okay, so I know how a person knows because someone I n knew had them. Explain to us on the physical body how a person would know that there's a problem with bed bugs in their house. Okay, um, you know, the, the, the first way that people notice they'll have bed, bite, bed bugs for the most part is a bite response. Mm -hmm. And it's not really like a mosquito bite or a flea bite because no, almost everyone has a mosquito bite reaction. Mm -hmm. Bed bugs, since they are um, obligate parasites of humans, they really only feed on humans and, and develop well. Mm -hmm. They are kind of uniquely adapted. So about 30% of the human population doesn't show a bed bug bite when they've been bitten by bed bugs. Really? Most other people don't have an immediate bite response. Like if you've, you've been bitten by a mosquito, you watch the welt show up instantly. Mm -hmm. um, I have no people and I've actually subjected myself to bed bug bites in a clinical circumstance to see what the bites look like and it took me five or six days to form a bed bug bite response. Really? Yeah. So it says, so so with traveling, you obviously could have traveled, have, have vacation somewhere or gone somewhere, come back and, and you're, you didn't even know that you were bitten until a week later. 
yeah. when that actually starts to happen. Absolutely. And and I believe it's like a burning itch is it burning itchy kind yeah. of Yeah. It's um it, it does have some similarity to a mosquito bite. It does have a bit of a raised welt. Um, they tend to be much more red and inflamed. Uh, the itchiness is significant, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And bed bug bites seem to have a cumulative effect in, in human physiology. Um, so, you know, multiple bites on a limb will cause the whole limb to swell. So if, really? you get a, if you get bit 12 times below the elbow, you can expect your forearm to, to kind of swell up a little bit. Now, this, of course, isn't something that you would handle, but the, the, as from, from a doctor's standpoint, what, do you know what they give people who, to um, counteract that? The, really, the only treatment is to try and limit the body's uh, autoimmune response to it. So it's kind of a histamine treatment or, okay. or things like, like that. Like a Benadryl kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, and, okay. and that's really the best part. I mean, there are some people that have graduated response to it. It's, w again, it, the bed bug biology is weird. There are some people that will have a diminished response until they ultimately don't have bite response after a couple of years of being persistently fed on. Okay. There are people who will in have an increased response and, and will eventually come to have systemic signs, you know, exhibit signs of, of physical stress, sweating, elevated heart really? rate, elevated blood pressure. Wow. Um, you know, a, a, good, a good part of that is probably the, the, the psychosomatic response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, psychologically, bed bugs are a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. You know, people get very, very upset, very freaked out about it. Um, it's not really a nice thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and people forget that bed bugs don't spread disease. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they don't kind of have the interaction with, with humans that mosquitoes do. Mosquitoes mm -hmm. will, will, will pass disease from insect to bird to human to back and forth and, mm -hmm. and be individual reservoirs of, of disease on their own. Bed bugs don't have that type of biology. And bed bugs aren't only in beds. No. Okay. T no, talk about that because I know about that too. Bed bugs will be where you are. Okay. Um, they're they're kind of lazy from a locomotive uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. They'll want to be within three to six feet of a food source, and you know, it, it's hard to understand the the way insects behave because it's so uniquely different from humans. You know, first they're cold blooded, so if they don't need to move, they won't, and they don't get bored. Mm -hmm. They basically only really move to find a meal or find a mate or lay eggs. Okay. So it's a very simple life, and, and if they only feed every three days, there's a good chance that they'll really only move once every three days. Okay, I'm getting a little squeamish now. <laughs> they, when they do, they harbor into wood? I, 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 that was my understanding? Yeah, they... When, they they're, not, when they're not chewing on your finger, <laughs> they go back to where? Um, they prefer some type of rigid environment, so wood like in a box spring or in the yes. junctions for um, wooden bed furniture, especially the unfinished wood, um, the sections of the bed that might be primarily particle board or the underside, so it's a not finished, unvarnished kind of surface. Okay. Those are the areas, those roughened areas are the places they really love to hide. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I am feeling a little squeamish about this now. Don't worry. If anything happens, I know a good exterminator. I know you know a good exterminator. <laughs> okay. So the bed bug issue we talked about, and I think, I, I know that that people would be more knowledgeable now about what to do and, and to call you and say, well, gee, I think this might be a problem. How do you go in and find them? There's a couple different ways to go. Um, for the most part, we start off with a basic technical inspection where we'll have a, a technician go in and, and do a visual inspection. Um, you know, looking for insects themselves, um, droppings, feces of the insects, mm -hmm. uh, eggs for the insects. Um, and all those things are visible. You know, people, you know, there's the rumor going around the, the insects are invisible. You know, al although when the eggs are very first, when the eggs are first laid, they're very small and mm -hmm. almost translucent. Same thing with when the insects first hatch but they're all visible. So you'll always, you know, someone with good vision or wearing glasses will always be able to see them mm -hmm. with time for a good inspection. Mm -hmm. The inspections are very time consuming because, you know, you're, you're literally looking for something the size of a, you know, a fraction of a grain of rice okay. in a bedroom. Okay. And they're so good at hiding, it makes it, you know, very, very difficult to, to kind of get lucky and find one right away. Okay, so you got lucky and you found it. What happens now? Um, we, there's a couple different ways to, to do control, you know, steam cleaning has been very good, but, you know, there's some issues without using residual uh, pesticides behind. Um, you know, one thing that we've found with using heat-based treatment or steam-based treatment is that, you know, every insect that you don't come in contact with is fine. Mm -hmm. You know, we've found that in the last 15 years or so that um, 
combining mechanical controls like bed bug traps, uh, mattress encasements, and things like that with um, repeated pesticide applications. That really works the best. And we've, we've tweaked some things to, to make it work a little better. Mm -hmm. You know, we, do a, we rotate our chemicals through. Um, we actually use insect growth regulators, w which disrupt the normal birth uh, and life cycle of the insect. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the products we use are, are, have been tested by the EPA, and, and uh, you know, we're getting into an era now where products are designed for use on bed bugs. Oh, okay, Cause of, because of the need. I would yeah. imagine that, that that actually came about. Yeah, there was, there was no research being done on bed bugs until 2001 because it wasn't a commercial issue, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden the research scientists found themselves in a position that, you know, the last book that was written on bed bug control is 50 years old and doesn't True, take into account any new chemistry or new products available. Stuff that's going on right now. Yeah, so we, we found some new products that were actually, you know, some that were used for ant control or, and retooled or repurposed with uh, mm -hmm. application in aerosol can or things like that. Um, the toxicity is toned down for application indoors, and they work really, really well. Now, you brought up ants, okay. Why is it that there is probably, there are probably two weeks out of the year that all of a sudden they appear? Why do they come out, and why do they disappear? Well, like I mentioned before, ants and termites predate humans in this environment. So they were always here. Mm -hmm. We're in their way. Okay. And there is that two week a year time where ants are responding to climatological change. They're starting to wake up in the springtime and their natural food source, which generally at that time of year would be the plants and um, nectars, fruits and things like that that mm -hmm. would be available or naturally occurring sources of protein aren't available yet. Mm -hmm. So normally ants would be very stressed because that food source wouldn't be there for them, which causes them to get kind of brazen and turn up on your kitchen table. Oh, be okay. Because the sugar in the plants outside is very similar to the sugar that can be obtained from your house. Now, any truth to uh, laying down a long string of salt? At, at an entry point where ants are coming in to prohibit them from coming in? Actually, yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay, um, I did that. And go ahead, the, why? Uh, the mechanical process is very simple. All insects have a difficulty maintaining moisture balance in their bodies. Okay. Okay, because of their size and their hard exoskeletons. So we actually use products uh, with silica aerogel or silica dust in it or you know, kind of um, diatomaceous earth is another product that we use, mm -hmm. all because the, the product will abrade the insect's exoskeleton. It'll cause small ridges and bumps and tears in the insect's outer. Uh, so they try to eat it then, in other words? No, or it's actually caustic for them to m move across. The, the hard crystals for oh. the salt not only damage their exoskeleton, it'll actually pull moisture out of them. Really? So while s like food grade salt isn't as effective, the silica aerogel, which is uh, an artificial compound, mm -hmm. um, that works phenomenally well. Okay. And it works on the exact same principle of, uh, of, dam of exoskeleton damage and desiccation. So that's why they, they I, I always did that and it seemed to work and I, and I could never understand why, but that would be the explanation. So we're talking about bugs, but I also know at your office I've seen some very unusual looking rodents. Okay. You're talking about the Halloween rats? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about the rats and the mice and whatever else, because you do them too. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Alrighty. Is that a trap? Is it how? What? How do? You, what do you do? Um, it, it depends on the amount of rodents, the type of rodents, their exposure to previous attempts at pest control. Um, it, for the most part, mice are not very intelligent. You know, they mm -hmm. just re reproduce in high numbers. Well, so Mickey, though. I mean, Mickey Mouse and Minnie. I mean, Disney would probably probably disagree with you, but anyway, <laughs> go ahead. They're very rich mice. They might, <laughs> they they might not be that intelligent, they're very but they're extremely wealthy. Okay. Um, so th th the biggest thing to combat with mice is, is that large reproductive event. So the idea of putting out two snap traps for 10 mice is always going to be a losing battle because they'll be able to, they'll be able to outproduce you. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're kind of pushed into using baits a lot of times for control 
or, or items we call multiple catch devices, which are fancy names for different types of steel boxes that would entice a mouse to come inside and, and not be able to come back out again. What would be the biggest uh, size rat you ever caught? Could you, sh like... I would say the largest one would probably be like that-ish without the tail. Oh. Without um, the tail? Yeah. I really am getting the chills throughout this whole thing, just to let you know. Okay. And uh, possums. How about possums? Because I've had possums in Bayonne. Yeah. Uh, um, what do you, how about them? We used to do a lot of wildlife work, but a couple of years ago, the state kind of changed it. Really? Um, yeah. And, it, and they, took the, they basically took the side of wildlife. Okay. And do the regulations and the specializations that went along with it, we kind of went away from that a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and animal control really does a pretty decent job of keeping up with possums and raccoons. Okay. But, you know, the, the thing that really brings a lot of possums to this area is the large amounts of waterfront that we have and True. specifically how much of it's unused. Mm -hmm. So possums are one of the most efficient feeders in, in the marsupial world. I mean, they just can really eat and digest anything and they don't ever get sick. They're very, very hardy. And they're always in my garbage cans. Yeah. That's, that would be why. Yeah. I exactly. Mean, and you know, if you put them in a Rubbermaid container, they'll chew right oh, through it in five or 10 minutes. They so. would. Okay. All righty. So we've covered bugs. We've covered rodents. Um, what, what's new in the bug world? Anything coming, anything you see as being a possible problem coming down the line? Um, y you know, I, I think the biggest thing we're dealing with right now is we're starting to get a handle of the bed bug thing. Okay. Um, for a while, stink bugs were an issue. Stink bugs. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, Imported pests are always going to be a problem. A stink bug bug is imported. Well, we've had native stink bugs here All and right, native come ladybugs on now. here. I'm sorry, Ralph. You know I want to laugh. Where do they come from? Stinky Town. I mean, <laughs> the the stink bug I'm talking about is actually from southeastern China. Southeastern China. I think we need another show with Ralph because <laughs> Ralph is taking us now. We're going all the way to China about with the stink the stink bug. Now, does it stink? Is that why when it's you crush called? Them, yeah. So, so that's where it gets the name stink bug yep. from? Absolutely. Okay. And we have them in Bayonne? Yeah. We do? Yep. They were imported into Allentown in the 90s, and they moved around because they outcompete our native stink bug. And the biggest thing that they do is instead of dying off in the winter like our native guys, uh -huh. they come inside to find warmth, which will, in some areas, leave a homeowner with several dozen to several hundred stink bugs in the house. Okay. Which no one wants. Um, you know, again, they're not a disease-causing insect. They don't damage food, but they're gross. And when they show up in the dozens or hundreds, what do they look like? Um, small brown, a shield-shaped bug. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, so there was a competition between our native stink bugs and the stink bugs that came from China. But the China, the Chinese ones, have won more or less. Pretty much. Wow. So they're all they're all year long stink stink bugs. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a problem in the spring and the fall mostly. Okay. Um, they've actually become an agricultural pest. Okay. Farmers, especially in Monmouth County, have found that they damage peach and orange crops. Really. Which can be a huge economic problem because mm -hmm. a lot of times you don't see the damage until the food's to market. Really. Which will uh, not only affect the farmer's bottom line, will affect his reputation as as a viable produce source. Ralph, I have to tell you, we didn't even get to fleas. I don't think we will be getting to fleas. But I you're think not completely grossed out yet. I'm not completely grossed out, <laughs> but I think I think we need to have another show. And I think, as always, because your family's been in Bayonne so long, okay, and I know that you love Bayonne, okay, I'm giving you one of my I love Bayonne buttons, of course, but of course it's on a fly swatter. I mean, flies are a simple thing to get rid of. Thank you. But if you have anything that we discussed, if you have any type of a bug problem or a rodent problem, Ralph would be the person that you would call. His family-owned business on Avenue C has been around forever. His mom is wonderful. She sits right there. She's the great cheerleader for the business. And I hope we helped you with our information and look forward to seeing you again. Wow. We do. We need another show. Thank you. Don't you excellent. think?